Good morning, everyone. So great to see you again this morning. Um, hope you're loving the sunshine and the warmer weather. And you haven't quite melted yet. Uh, we're glad to uh, get a little bit of a break this summer, uh, at least some of us. I uh, want to let you know that Pastor Kelvin and his family are gone this Sunday and the next. So they'll be spending some time in the mountains. I want to pray for them that they'll have a blessed time and also be kept safe. But before I share uh, one more announcement, I want to share a verse with you from Ephesians. And uh, it says in Ephesians 5, at the end of verse 8 and verse 9, Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So we have this great privilege to not just know about some light, but actually be by very nature be light as Jesus is light of the world and we get to carry our light into this world which is not just this little light of mine but when you really think about it Christ is a big light and he's given to us and uh, we have so many opportunities to share not just uh, in word but especially through the way we live and that's something that Paul is particularly emphasizing there before the worship team comes and uh, leads us in a few songs, just one more quick reminder that there are still brochures available for the ladies' retreat. So if there's any ladies here interested in the one-day retreat on September 26, take a look and uh, you still have a few time days to return the applications. But now let's worship together. Good morning, everybody. Um, you guys can feel free to stand if you'd like to worship. Um, also a reminder, if you guys are wearing a mask, uh, you are welcome to sing softly. And yeah, so feel free to stand. Stand. Sing. <laughs> and <laughs> I'll start us off in prayer. Jesus, thank you for today, for the fact that we can continue to gather together and worship you in the same building. I um, want to continue to pray for the people who aren't able to be here for various reasons, um, just want to pray that you stretch your arm of protection out to the, towards them. Um, I want to pray for this time of worship that the Holy Spirit comes out and does his thing and um, that your presence can be very much felt this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
You may be seated. We want to continue today uh, in our series of messages on Paul's letter to the Philippians, and we're still in chapter 3. And I want to continue reading where Pastor Jesse left off uh, last week, so I'll be reading this morning from uh, verse 12 to 21. And this is what it says. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have take hold, taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and I'll tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Dear friends, I want to take you on a little bit of an adventure this morning. I don't know how adventurous you will actually be, but I want to take you a train ride. And don't worry, we're not leaving the building, we're not heading over to the McKernan station of the LRT, or even further away to uh, Jasper and or Lake Louise and take the Rocky Mountaineer train that takes you right through the mountains, although I think some of us would really enjoy a scenic ride more so than sitting inside a church building. No, I want to take you onto a train in a more metaphorical way as we reflect together on the journey of faith, the way Paul describes it for us in the words that we have just heard. I still remember uh, my very first train ride. It's one of my earliest memories, and I believe it was my grandparents that took me on it. Uh, we went to the train station in our little village in Germany, and the train that came there usually hourly was a commuter train, and uh, I actually brought a picture. Uh, at least I found something very close to, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is very close to the kind of train I went on, and it may seem very ordinary here, and maybe even old. Uh, I looked it up, they started building these in the 1940s, and they were still in service until the early 1980s, that's when I graduated from high school. But when I was a young child, uh, this was actually a little bit intimidating, you know, seeing that thing roll in and, you know, seeing a, a big train for the first time. Uh, I was a little bit scared to get on it, but I did get on it with the help of my grandparents. And it was not because I knew anything about the guy in front and, uh, you know, inside the locomotive that was uh, operating the train. I mean, who really ever does? Even when it comes to plane rides, you know, you don't know your captain, even though you hear him over the intercom. But uh, I got it because I trusted my grandparents. I knew they would not take me to any place where I would be harmed. And so in spite of my fears, I got on, uh, got on these high stairs and uh, into the second class passenger car. And not very long after that, uh, we heard the whistle and train took off and from on, a very smooth ride, uh, enjoyable and uh, fascinating for me as a young kid. By the way, I don't know if it's just a German thing, but uh, at least when I grew up, trains were a big thing, not just for the kids. Uh, even the adults loved having uh, these uh, 
model trains at home for those who have the space and the money to pay for it. And you know, some of them were really elaborate with mountains and little villages, you know, and uh, even uh, the, what do you call them? Uh, that, that, that come down at, at the crossings. Anyway. Copper. Yeah. And, and flashing lights and everything. Now, we had one very special Christmas as, as boys. When we had unpacked all our gifts, my dad said there was still one more gift waiting in the basement, and that was a big uh, train track, actually a very simple one, you know, just one long track going all around in the middle of the little train station. And that was it. It looked actually quite self-made. I don't think he bought that at any store. He obviously got the parts for it, but put it together himself. And then uh, we set it up in uh, that one room where all three of us boys slept. And uh, we turned off all the lights and then we watched that train run around. This train had a little light in the front. And so all you could see is, you know, where the train would go next. And we just could watch that for hours. We just didn't want to stop. We didn't want to go to bed that night. That's how fascinating it was. Now, if you look at Paul's journey of faith, the day it began, was actually quite a dramatic intervention in Paul's life. Many of you will remember the story, but just as a quick reminder, I'm gonna read it again, just the first few verses of Acts chapter nine, where Luke reports to us, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there, who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And that's where it all began for Paul. In truly coming to know who Jesus is. While having a very different kind of image or belief before. Even to the point of being one of the most severe persecutors of the Christian church at that time. And at that time, these were, you know, maybe just a few hundred people. Well, actually by Acts 9 we have of course, the 3,000 added on Pentecost Day. But still, compared to today, you know, the church was this tiny speck amongst, you know, a vast number of pagans and people who mostly had polytheistic beliefs. And, uh, you know, it was, was not easy for these early Christians being regarded as this tiny sect and uh, very suspicious in the eyes of many, all kind of rumors were spread about them. Uh, and here we have someone who has made it his life mission to extinguish the still very small and very young church. And to see that life turn around, to see Jesus uh, actually reaching into Paul's life, knowing what it would take for him not just metaphorically, but literally see the light, to understand why Jesus died on the cross. And that he was not, you know, some heretic that was rightfully executed, but actually the one whom God confirmed as the true Messiah when he raised him from the dead. And without Jesus having been raised, you know, there would not have been an encounter here before Damascus. But that's how it began for Paul. And what Jesse read to us last week, uh, in this biographical part here in the uh, first half of Philippians 3, that is not just told sort of as a you know, quick uh, introduction, this is who I, Paul, am, and this is what happened in my past, but it's actually to give us a model of what all our journeys in the faith do look like. Because even though the details may differ to a great 
uh, degree. And I would, you know, bet any money here this morning that not a single person here sitting in the benches ever had a light from heaven appear and blind you <laughs> for several days that you couldn't see and have an audible voice where Jesus would talk to you. You all have your own life stories. But the very fact that you're sitting here this morning tells me God has worked in your life. And he has made himself known in no lesser way than he did to Paul. And that's really how it begins with all of us. And like I told you earlier with my grandparents, sometimes it is not because we know a whole lot about the one who is truly all about, who's driving that train, but it's because people helped us along, people whom we trusted and were examples to us. And actually, this is what Paul is trying to be now for the Philippian Christian, to give them a model, an example, an encouraging word to tell them, you can come along on the same journey together with me. Now, the first thing uh, that Paul is pointing out here is uh, what he's chasing after is not just to reach some far off goal, you know, something that will await us uh, after we die or when Jesus comes back, even though that's obviously mentioned here as well, but it's about the journey itself. And the two are actually closely related. The same Jesus who will appear in the future is also the one whom he is chasing after right now to know him more and more and deeper and deeper. Very similar to what we sang in the ocean song here at the end. And I appreciate, you know, sometimes how God arranges the worship team picking songs even though they didn't exactly know what I would be talking about here this morning. But that's God's desire. Not just to know a few facts about him, but as we go forward into the future with every step that we take to actually uh, have a deeper trust, to even learn new things about him and how God works, to gain a greater appreciation. You see something similar in Paul's letter to the Ephesians when he has one particular prayer request now for this church. But the pattern is the same. Starting in verse 16 there, Ephesians 3, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. See that, that same kind of image not just to know God is loving but to actually gain a sense of the vast dimensions that, that, that actually explode our minds when we really open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit, opening these inner eyes of the heart. And uh, it seems like Paul is, is expecting that as he's praying that this is the kind of work that God will do on the inside. But this is not something, you know, that in some way was told by others to pursue this this grew naturally because as he became to know Christ more each day it, uh, it it became a desire that he himself saw was more worthy than anything else to pursue remember that contrast uh, last week between the scuba <laughs> That word that Jesse explained to us, you know, this rubbish, this, this not so pleasant thing, it may have even been a swear word, but this treasure in comparison, having found what he calls the righteousness that God gives in Christ through, through faith. 
In other words, we do not have to struggle and strive for God to accept us or to forgive us our sins. But he's giving all of that as a free gift in his son. And Paul recognizing what that exchange looked like, you know, no one had to give him any kind of extra encouragement. This is what now became his life mission. I want to experience more and more of that. And the closer we come then to that final destiny, um, the rest of it is becoming sort of an add-on, an extra gift. Not to play that down in any way, but uh, this is also part of the package. Let me now just go back to Philippians 3 one more time and uh, just point out a couple of verses here. The first one is uh, in, in verse 14 where he calls this goal the price for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then again in verse 20 where heaven comes up one more time. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what will Jesus do when he appears? He will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. There's actually two kinds of transformations going on at the same time. The one on a more daily basis where we're drawn deeper into the mystery of being close to Christ and getting to know him in a deeper and greater way. But there's also a bodily transformation that awaits right at the very end. And that's encouraging particularly for the older ones among us. Some of you who may be struggling with how your body is not doing the kind of things that you were able to do maybe 10, 20 years ago. I just mentioned to my wife the other day is, you know, I don't like how I'm turning into my dad. Because, uh, you know, in these later years that I've known him, without fail, every single evening, around 8 o'clock, maybe 9 o'clock, you know, he'd still be sitting in his chair, his little glass of wine in front of him, and his eyes would get heavy, and all of a sudden he'd be gone, you know, completely fallen asleep. So I can barely watch a TV show anymore, even in the early evening nowadays, without actually falling asleep for a while. And that's one of the minor things, you know, of noticing that you get older. But some of us, you know, have more severe pains and, and, and other things associated with old age. And it's wonderful to know. We're not stuck with that. What Paul calls here the lowly body, but it will be transformed by the very power of Christ that he has over all of his creation. Be given a new body. This is not the only place where this is mentioned, of course. I just want to give you one more example from 1 John 3. Let me read there from verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be, has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. I don't know if you caught that last part about purification. You gotta wonder how do those two connect? You know, this future return of Jesus Christ, not coming secretly, you know, in a cradle in Bethlehem, but, but actually powerfully seen by every eye and making all things new, and in this case, our very own bodies, giving us a new body. So even though this is in the future, he says, as you're looking forward to that, you are now being purified. What's happening here? I believe uh, what this is basically about is something that's going on in your own mind. 
I believe most of our struggle, and to come back to the picture of the train ride, is that sometimes other things, you know, seem to become at least temporarily a different destination. Something, you know, that may fascinate us, something where we all of a sudden pour our hearts and time and energy in, and these things easily become an idol. And God, during those times, often then becomes nothing more than an afterthought. Now when you are reminded anew where your life is truly headed and where Christ wants you to be, this is where your mind is being reoriented and the purification that takes place here is not so much a forgiveness of sins, generally speaking, but it's really about the mind being renewed and cleansed from all the things, you know, where we often set false goals and uh, false priorities. We have uh, similar wording in uh, Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 12, where he speaks about the renewing of the mind in verse 2. He says there, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I think that's partially of what's going on here. Paul's talking to the uh, Christians in Philippi, and he knows how they can easily be sidetracked. Another obstacle that uh, pops up here is, of course, the past. When you look back to some times in your life that you're not proud of, when you look back at some failures or even just some big losses that were really hard to get over or that you haven't gotten over yet. Um, this is something that is experienced like getting stuck or feeling paralyzed. And uh, it's almost as if Satan is whispering in, into your ear, you know, about how unworthy you are because of your specific failures. And sometimes we don't just fail a little bit, but we fail spectacularly. And whenever we're reminded of those things in the past, you know, that is like holding you back to really moving forward. Or really seeing you worthy as someone that even God would have an interest in. And that's why Paul says here, he's not only pressing on, not just uh, reaching forward, but he's also forgetting what is behind. That's in the middle of verse 13. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. And really think about it. If Christ died for every single sin, not just the ones in your past, but even the ones you will still commit in the future, and there will be times where we stumble and fail, then why get hung up so much on that? Why do we have to think, well, we're, we're such horrible people? Maybe as parents we failed some of our children or as husbands, or wives. And if we always think about, you know, the mistakes you've made, uh, how you should have done things, or should have said certain things and you didn't, you can feel that you're under such condemnation. And this is really something like the train's getting stuck. Because you, you yourself are putting the brakes on. Not that you could do that with a literal train, except for the emergency brake that you have, uh, you know, spread out certain distances. But, you know, Christ wants to move you forward. He doesn't want us to constantly be paralyzed by those particular times where each one of us knows, well, we really messed up here. Our identity lies 
in what he's done for us, in the value that he attributes us despite of all of these things. And to me, one of the greatest verses in all of the New Testament is the one that said, God is faithful. And even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. Good question. Are you so thankful for that? That God is that faithful with you? Walking alongside you, not just when you are praying, you know, and doing all the things that you would expect a Christian to do, but especially when you're rebellious, when you insist on your own way, when you even have a completely false picture of him and maybe for that reason turn to other idols. God remains faithful. He doesn't drop. He doesn't say, well, you've really blown it this time. But he continues to walk with each one of us. There's one last thing I'd like to point out here, and that's that we can move forward with confidence because of the fact that Jesus will complete our transformation. We already looked at this here in verse 20. But what I want to point out here is the power of Jesus Christ. It's not just power he'll demonstrate again in that far point away in whatever future it may be. And we don't know when Jesus will come back. So many people, you know, right now through the COVID times are in this sort of mood, this got to be the end of the world because everything's so different and everything, you know, Take so much getting used to it, and it just feels so wrong, and, and it's just dragging out, and we don't know when it will it all end, and, and people come up with all kinds of speculations again, just as they've done during other times when the world was in turmoil. I still remember 9-11 and, you know, the, the Twin Towers um, on fire before they crumbled, and they shut down all the air traffic, and it was a similar kind of... Uh, feeling or sensation at the time that what's happening in the world, you know, is that the end? Or if you went further back when Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait, you know, and the oil wells were all set on fire and the day was turned into night, so many people expect, well, that's got to be now really close to the end. And yet, history continued. The train keeps on rolling and you don't know exactly when the time will be, where that journey will come to an end. But the confidence here is not so much about the timing, but the very fact that the, the Savior Jesus Christ has the power to transform you with your new body and your resurrection just as He will make all other things new. This is what God is up to in His work with this world. This is the ultimate destination and it will come. And because you have that kind of assurance that God is not finished yet, but very much able to do everything he sets out to do, you do not have to worry. I don't have to worry. That's easier said than done because I'm a big worrier. I inherited that from my mother. Sorry, Mother, I didn't mean to blame you. But it seems to be in my genes. And some of my children have inherited that as well. You know, always imagining what's the worst thing that can happen. As if that's what's lying ahead. No, what's lying ahead is that God is working today and He will work tomorrow in the same way. And the power He has to subdue all things, bring everything under His control. That is the foundation of our trust. And then, you know, no matter what, what happens to us, even if we should get a horrible illness or some other disaster that may happen in the family that we have a very difficult time dealing with, you know, Christ remains the same. His power is not any lessened. And if we take that hand, we also know He will safely take us into that glorious future he has. Let me pray 
Father, I'm so grateful that we are yours, that you have worked in our lives powerfully, just the same way you have with the Apostle Paul. And that you've given him to us as an example and as a reminder that you're both the author and the finisher of our faith, and that every day you are at work to transform us, to take, take us into a deeper appreciation and love and knowledge of you. And I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will continue that work, that he will pull us away from the idols, pull us away from useless uh, getting hung up on the past and failure, and really moving forward step by step, slowly but surely. And Lord, where we have failed, I, I do pray that you may forgive us, that you also help us to reconcile with people that we may still be in conflict with. And so many other things, Lord, where you instruct us to uh, trust in your will, to allow you to take charge. Thank you for your power that will also transform even our physical bodies and this entire world. You have promised you will make all things new. And one day we will join with the many voices in heaven, innumerable people and angels, praising the Lamb, the one who has redeemed us, the one who is the true Lord of this world, and the one who will make all things beautiful in his own time. We thank you and praise you for that in Jesus' name. Let's sing one final song of the devotion. I invite you to stand for the last song.